Call to order. The first item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next item on the agenda is adjustments to the agenda. Charlie? Um, under item new business um, 9A and B, before we, get, before we go into new business, I would like to take a five minute break. Thank you. Are there any other adjustments? The next item is the approval of the January 9th um, school board minutes and the January 29th school board special meeting minutes. Are there any corrections? I didn't find any. Okay. Seeing none, those are approved. The next item is comments by high school and middle school reps. I don't think they're high school. Oh, there is. Oh, James, sorry. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, I'm James Kittredge. I guess I'm filling in tonight because nobody else is here. So I'll make some stuff up for you, I guess. Um, first of all, I guess I'll start with uh, high school speech. I just came back from a very successful MFA States tournament. Uh, and we swept the tournament, beating Skowhegan, which was really nice. And we have, um, previously, we went to the CFL National Qualifying Tournament the week before. Uh, and we had uh, qualifiers for the national tournament, Jer Clucci, Michael Oliviero. Um, and they have the option of going to CFL Nationals. Oh, Jen Cannell as well. Uh, we have our district tournament, which is the qualifier for the NFL Nationals coming up in April. Also, our girls basketball team will be in the state tournament coming up soon and uh, swim meets will be coming up this, this weekend and following. And I guess that's all for now. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. James, Thanks. did you enjoy the escort you had from Scarborough the other night? Well, truth be told, I didn't actually get to go, oh. but I heard it was fabulous. Yeah, that was uh, sort of Spur of the moment, we ought to thank the um, Cape Elizabeth Police Department for rustling up some, um, I think, a police cruiser and uh, a couple of other vehicles to give uh, an escort to the speech team as they were coming back. Um, one of our fathers, Lou McNally, called around to call me, called, uh, suggested he call the police, and I called him. So we wanted to make the point that the speech and debate teams deserve an escort as much as their athletic teams. And that's not being said to denigrate the athletic teams. It's being said to make the point that the academic-based uh, teams are very important, too. And congratulations. Thank you. Middle school representatives. OK, I've got some bad news and some good news. I'll give you the bad news first so we can leave on a better note. <laughs> <laughs> The middle school has had excellent behavior at the last two socials and one dance, but a few immature students couldn't control themselves at the last dance. These kids did such things as put gum on the DJ's expensive lights, throw small candy hearts at him, and unplug the equipment. Mr. Jewett had a talk with the 7th and 8th grade last week during lunch. Then the next day, several student council members went around and read an announcement to our peers in hopes that if they wouldn't listen to Mr. Jewett, that they would listen to us. We expressed our embarrassment and asked for those who had done wrong to confess to Mr. Jewett. There would be no punishment, but they would write letters of apology to our DJ. A few students have come forth and the letters were sent. The student council was discussing possible solutions, such as only punishing the wrongdoers if they are caught doing anything inappropriate at the March dance or any other dance this year. This could possibly be not allowing them into any further dances this year, including the last dance. As it is, Mr. Jewett said that if there is any appropriate behavior at the dances, we will cancel the rest for the year. As a student council, we are trying to avoid punishing the whole 7th and 8th grade for behavior of a few students. Okay, on a brighter subject, <laughs> the 8th grade took the language assessment test last month. This included both an oral and written portion. The top 28 students in French and Spanish, based on their grade point average, will be taking the national French and Spanish exams in March. 
The annual spelling bee will be held this Thursday morning. The top three spellers from each grade will be participating. The talent show will be held on March 28th. This should be both fun and entertaining. Also, Mr. Madden took 13 eighth graders to visit paths this morning. I think you all know what that is. Okay. Um, the last thing I have is breaks in the eighth grade have been controlled for the past month by what we like to call a bad boy and a bad girl room. There is, this is a room where the students are sent who have been misbehaving during break. They spent their break, they spend their break there for the following two weeks as a punishment and that seems to be working well because we had a few problems with break times before. That's it. Thank you. Are there any questions? I appreciate your explanations. They are very colorful. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Very accurate. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is communications. And at this point, I just wanted to um, communicate to the family of Chad Duty and to Amanda Roberts our sympathy and our thoughts are with them. And um, we hope them all the best. Other communications? Yes, and I certainly would like to um, echo that. Our prayers are with you all. Uh, communications I did. I actually had a little notice here on the congratulations of the speech and state tournament. I think we actually had a better report than I can give, but I know that we're very proud of their work and look forward to seeing what else happens during the season. Uh, and in your packet, I included some communications, uh, a letter of thanks uh, to us for hosting the naturalization ceremony, which took place January 25th. Those of us who were able to be there it was very moving. There were, um, it says here, 58 uh, people, and I think it was, I counted 28 countries, although they said it was actually representing 30 countries, and uh, people from a fairly uh, a youngster whose family was also uh, being naturalized, the rest of the family, a fairly young person, uh, all the way up to people that I think would certainly belong to my generation. Um, it was a wonderful opportunity, and we had our fourth grade students there who had been doing some study on the naturalization process, and they definitely gave us feedback that they got a lot out of that on-the-spot um, ceremony. I included a couple of letters from Gail Adshead, our, the chair of our science department, uh, one thanking um, John Albin for his contribution to their uh, computer program. Also letting us know she has been on a part-time assignment this year that she is coming back full-time. Another letter from Rachel Garrett, who is giving us, also has been on leave this year, indication she's coming back. I included a, <laughs> an article with a few comments from one of our parents, uh, Dick McGoldrick, about um, perhaps room for improvement in school lunches. Uh, as I read the menu in this article, I think Cheaper's uh, that's what we had. I think I'd be there every day. But, you know. <laughs> I would also, however, like to balance that by saying I certainly understand there are constraints and that there are have been some sincere efforts to uh, improve that. However, there it is. Um, and those are my communications. The next item on the agenda is superintendent's report. And I'd like to start this evening uh, by asking three people to come down to the podium, and I'll, I'll come down there too. Um, what this is, I'm not, yes, see, I guess there is a, uh, sure, there's a microphone over there. I can explain it when we get here, but it's special recognition for our technology program from the high school. So if Betsy Nielsen, Gary Lenoy, and Jim Ray will come down front, please. really very nice to be able to uh, have a, I don't want to drop those. So I'm going to read what this says. Uh, the board has had it in their packets, but for those of you who haven't, this is a communication uh, from the Office of the Governor. It says to Gary Lenoy, Betsy Nielsen, Jim Ray, Cape Elizabeth Technology Education Program, Cape Elizabeth School Department, dear Gary, Betsy, and Jim. It was with Great pleasure that I extend to the three of you congratulations on receiving the 1995-96 TEAM, in capital letters, Technology Education 
Program Excellence Award. You should be proud of your accomplishments, for this is indeed a prestigious honor. The team award celebrates educators who successfully integrate technology into the learning process and who encourage students to become technologically literate. You have clearly demonstrated a commitment to educating students about our increasingly technological society by enhancing their abilities to interact with computers in the classroom environment. On a personal note, I thank you for your dedication to the students of Maine. Again, congratulations. Best wishes for continued achievement and success. Sincerely, and it's signed by our Governor Angus King. And we certainly want to add our congratulations, and I know that this program is one of those successfully evolving changes in education that we've gone from business education to, uh, you know, I, I don't want to use this in a pejorative sense, but the traditional IA program, which has many strong points. And all three of you are demonstrating the ability to change and modeling for students as well as your fellow educators what it means to become technologically literate. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Betsy. We, we hope you like the frames. If you don't, you can always make yourself new ones. <laughs> <laughs> I included in, in uh, also, uh, and I, uh, I want to back up a little bit here. We had a couple of other communications, um, but I'll just mention them as we're going through here. Uh, as administrators, we often talk, how do we get information out and what's a good way to do it? And we included a couple of memos here, one from Ponco, from Tom Eismeyer, explaining some of the work that's going on now with teacher groups. And he's here, would be happy to answer any questions you had. Um, the faculty work groups and some of the uh, particular projects that they are involved with. And we also have a communication from Nancy Hutton from the middle school outlining the school quality review initiative and uh, I received, Nancy, I received in the mail today from the Southern Maine Partnership more information with a, I don't know if you've gotten a copy of that, along with the possible application should the faculty decide to, to do that. You had both memos in your package. You've had a chance to read them. You haven't had a chance to read any of the background material in the school quality review, although some of you were present at a meeting we, we did actually over a year ago, giving some background on that, and I'd be happy to pass that around. Uh, any questions on either of those or comments? Tom, I just wanted to ask you to come up, if you would, and just speak a little bit about some other changes going on at Pond Cove in terms of scheduling options. Um, sure. We have been looking at the uh, what we call the Allied Arts rotation since the beginning of the year. And now that we're about halfway through the year, we have a pretty good idea about how many teachers are going to be in each grade level. So in examining our schedule options for next year, the, the six-day rotation will no longer work because of the number of teachers. There's an odd number. We have seven or eight and so on. So that has caused us to look at the whole schedule, including uh, different options, perhaps for uh, having a later arrival for buses and uh, other things. So. Uh, we're discussing now through team leaders and uh, grade level teams are giving feedback and we're trying to figure out what we should do for next year. But part of it is that uh, we'll be changing the Allied Arts, we'll be on a more of a four or five rota rotation and we're probably going to rotate classes a little more through the cafetorium because we have so many kids in there at once. At the same time, get a rotation through the uh, playground area because we have so many kids and so much traffic. Thank you. Sure. Carla? I just wanted to mention that um, I'm really glad to see you looking into the Odyssey of the Mind program, which is, I have a nephew that does that in Houston, and it's a fabulous program. And also, I'm glad you're doing some information gathering on the multi-age groups. I know that's just information gathering at this point, but. That, that should be a good project, yeah. and the, uh, the Parents Association is very interested in Odyssey of the Mind. We'll have, a, I think, an informational meeting about that in April, so yeah. hope you can come. 
I think that's it. Thanks, Tom. Sure. Thank you. Um, the next item is the uh, report I included in your packet on Maine's learning results. Now, this is a topic that boards all throughout the state are going to be talking about a lot uh, in the next few years. Uh, I'm not sure, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a, a packet that looks something like this, uh, printed on both sides of the paper. It's going to take a while to read that and absorb it. I just want to make sure that you are uh, on top of what the implications are. I also just, it's a, if, in case you're looking for some little light reading on top of that one, um, this is an article that I thought you might be interested. Obviously, that's, we're not going to discuss it. It's simply background information. It's a fairly short article called Turning Systemic Thinking on Its Head. It's written by Michael Fullen, who is a really, really outstanding uh, an analyst of school change processes and what he has to say here about involving the staff, I think, is really. I have one more. Oh, sure. Um, how do we do it and what are the important ways to do it and so forth? I think you will find that if you uh, get a chance to look at that, it suggests some of the implications for making this learning results effort on the state's part actually work. Um, We've already started in the reading committee and the uh, science grant committee to discuss this very, very generally speaking. Uh, not all staff has had a chance to really see it. We have a workshop coming up where we will be talking about system-wide curriculum. There'll be some implications. Um, what I think the, the excitement that surrounds this effort uh, is real. I also want to point out, however, that the organizational capacity to really do this um, is, is also real. And, and how we build that capacity, how boards throughout the state uh, carefully tackle what can be done and done well without trying to do everything at once is going to be a real issue. Um, it's uh, there, actually it's a six year plan, five year plan with the current sixth grade the class that will have to pass a battery of assessments before they get their diploma. But we're a long way from knowing what those assessments will look like. It will be a combination of state assessment and local assessments. We have staff who already are working on the kinds of uh, open-ended assessments through uh, New Standards, a project that Nancy Hutton's been involved with and a number of our teachers at both the middle school and Pond Cove. Uh, through the Maine Math and Science Alliance, we've had some, uh, some of our staff has been involved in that, and just about everybody that teaches math and science will be involved with that before we're done. Uh, it's, but if you, when you look at the scope of these, um, it is a little mind-boggling, and I think we simply have to take a deep breath and plan. I wondered if you had any comments or responses or thoughts about this or going to make some nice light vacation reading. <laughs> <laughs> well, those, you know, anybody having, yeah. I wouldn't recommend taking it on, on a winter vacation trip personally. Um, <laughs> wait till you come back to, to tackle that. Can I just make one yeah. comment? Um, I, I've only just kind of leafed through it at this point, but it's pretty obvious that the time uh, factor is going to be substantial. In, in bringing this to bear, and there's no way it's going to be done in the six-hour school days <laughs> that we have now. And I, I think we should both be thinking about that um, as a school system, an individual school system, and really keeping a close eye on the on the state process because um, you know the funding to m make this come to pass is going to be huge. Yeah, it is. It is retooling the industry, and I shouldn't use, I don't like to use terms like that when I'm talking about teaching, but because people are familiar with what has happened in many of, of America's largest um, industries, uh, reshaping, just, just learning how to use the technology that goes along with some of this, that in itself is a massive uh, staff development task, and uh, we've had a lot of concentration this year on technology, uh, both with staff development and in the last two or three years with some of the budgetary outlays. But now we're really talking about a, the, the 
the board goals that you've had for the last five years about increasing expectations, consistency of curriculum, core curriculum, all of those issues that have been part of your concerns and discussions are certainly part of, of this trend. And you need to be also aware this is a national trend. This is not just a kind of one of those fly-by-night educational uh, issues that sometimes come and go. Um, this is an expression of concern on the part of many, many significant groups in our culture that we have not crafted our schools with a kind of intellectual expectations, the learning how to learn expectations that um, has been part of our, you know, the countries with which our kids are going to be competing for international jobs. So it's a serious, um, protracted effort. Uh, it's going to be easy for us to get discouraged, to feel that it's just too overwhelming. Um, on the other hand, I think a community like this one has many, many resources that will be brought to bear. And to be honest, it's consistent with what people have been saying. You know, I want to make sure my child is challenged uh, appropriately, not too much so, not driven into the ground, but challenged. And uh, the other very big theme behind all of this is a belief that all children can learn intellectually respectable material, that we should not feel that only some kids can learn important things. And I think we have some excellent models in our system of attempts to do that. Uh, one that pops to my mind immediately is the foreign language, because all our children in the middle school take foreign language, all of them. Admittedly, some go further, learn more, um, become more adept at the written aspect of that, but we are teaching foreign language to everybody, and I, am a, I think that's a model we need to look to. How are we doing it? What does it take? Um, those kinds of insights that have been learned there as well as in other areas. I don't want to slight other, other efforts, but that one I think will be a useful model as we get into some of this. Okay? Moving on. Um, the, we had, we had a uh, three-district meeting on our Science Foundation grant yesterday. We had our own core meeting today. Uh, we are making plans to have another um, major presentation for staff involved in math and science, and this time I hope we will be able to. We had some parents come to the last time we did something like that. This will be content, so those who were not particularly interested in the visioning meeting may in fact be able to make some of these others and we'll give you more um, information as that firms up. I'd like to pass this out. This is something called um, Learning Doesn't Take a Snow Day and this is a publication from Maine Math and Science Alliance and through our grant process we're connected with them. Um, I just love things like this. this. It says this is an emergency snowpack of educational ideas uh, and it says, is your idea of winter huddling next to the wood stove, pining for spring? Bundle up and go outdoors with the family to try some of these explorations in science and math. You'll discover how much fun cold weather can be. And so there are questions and activities for children and families, such as um, what happens to animals when they hibernate, where do, you know, where do butterflies, um, porcupines, or whatever. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I love stuff like this, and I picked up enough for all of you, and uh, I forgot to get myself one for my grandchildren. So if anybody here doesn't want it, please give it back to me. <laughs> they, the Maine Math and Science Alliance did something like that um, also for summer vacationers, and they passed it out at the um, Sea Dogs games. And uh, one of the ways by which you can tell whether something has actually been read at a uh, major event like the Sea Dogs games is how many wind up in the trash. So they asked the custodians how many they swept up. Almost none, maybe one. So families liked them and took them with them, uh, which is a compliment to the usefulness of this effort. And uh, the, the lady who was working on that, Mary Cerullo, is the parent, one of the parent uh, members on the South Portland core team that's working on our grant. So she brought those to us yesterday. So the next time you get snowed in, which isn't going to happen this year again. <laughs> um, focus groups I received back, um, volunteers, both parents and teachers. It looks, uh, my first thought was that the date that seemed to work the, for the most people was the evening of March the 11th. And then I looked at that week, that is a heavy week for 
it's a board week. Um, so it'll either be the 7th or the 11th, and I'm not sure what your um, timeline is, and I'll get that letter out to you by the end of the week and get it out to the people who have been gracious enough to volunteer to come back uh, so that our charge will be to revisit um, our current mission statement in the light of the discussions and the data that the focus groups popped up and to come back to you for the April board meeting with a recommendation for any changes. And last but not least, budget timeline, just a reminder, we have a Saturday meeting coming up on March 9th, uh, an all-day marathon into the wee hours of the morning, right? <laughs> lunch provided. But the, I, by the way, we did have a question because it wasn't, I think it was in the courier. The lunch that's provided isn't for the community. This is not a potluck <laughs> supper. It, the lunch is for the board and the administration who would be there. We'd be happy to share, but that wouldn't want to give the false impression. That. Also, Connie, I think the Han Cove was left out of the courier and it was high school twice. At the high well, school. we definitely are going to review Pondco. <laughs> In the afternoon, right? At one to three yeah. is Pondco. Okay. And those are my issues. Thank you, Connie. Next item on the agenda is school board subcommittees and reports. The first one, finance subcommittee, Charlie. Before we get started, did we have something else we needed to adjust? Three. Item 9E, were we going to table that? Yes, okay. we will, but I thought we'll we wait could have wait. a brief okay. discussion until okay. then. Okay, the Finance Subcommittee met at 6 o'clock in the Town Hall Chambers Conference Room. Um, the main focus of this particular Finance Committee meeting was a presentation from Scott Wyman on the MSMA Health Plan. Um, all of the school board members were present, as were representatives from the Cape Elizabeth Education Association, teachers and support staff and a representative from the Maine Education Association. Uh, we did sign the warrants. Um, that's essentially what took place in an hour and a half. <laughs> Next committee, um, Superintendent Search Committee. Um, Ann Chapman is going to be the chair of that committee and she's going to report. Um, <clears throat> I hope everybody in town has by now received um, the questionnaire that we are uh, re would really like everybody to fill out on um, the superintendent qualifications. I've heard from several people who have gotten it that they that they're finding it very difficult, and I say, well, you should feel really sorry for us because we're the one who has to, you know, make the ultimate decision. But I, I think it w it's a good exercise for people to, you know, to look at, at what the role of a superintendent is and focus on that again as as we begin that process. Um, we did start this process on uh, January 29th, and, and part of that packet was also a timeline of, of what we're going to be doing, so I'm not going to go through it um, here, but um, we did start the search on January 29th. The position is being advertised um, at this time. Applications are due March 1st. Uh, we don't have too many yet, but I'm sure we'll be getting more. Um, and then. <laughs> In, in March, we'll be screening um, and doing preliminary interviews. Um, and then in April, um, getting to uh, the final, final interviews. And we'll be updating the public um, at, the, at the board meetings. But the next opportunity for, for public input is uh, February 29th. I have that right. Yes. Which is a board workshop on, on the superintendent qualifications when you know, the criteria will actually be hammered out and I don't know if we have the place yet. I don't think we do have a that. place assigned. Okay. Um, so that's something we need to determine. Um, I'm sure it'll be at 7 o'clock, as they all are. Right now it's, it's assigned to the council chamber's conference room, but we may change it if you have a lunch. Um, we may need more space than that. We may not, but um, I think we might want to err on the side of wanting more space. I think it might be a good idea to do it um, in a over in the schools. Yeah, the maybe in one of the um, media center or the middle school library. Well, media center is a little bit better, or the cafetorium. Well, we'll make sure that it's posted and listed on the cable and, and in the paper so people will know um, the exact location. But. Um, we do encourage people to please attend that and please um, return those questionnaires. The, the input is extremely important um, to us in knowing the community's 
uh, desires as we go forward. Thank you, Anne. The next uh, report is from the Technology Committee. Charlie or Keith? Yeah. Keith. Uh, we met yesterday afternoon, and uh, a couple of items on the agenda. We discussed a variety of uh, internet access options that, that the school district uh, has. Uh, there's a lot of good deals out there, I think, in terms of uh, allowing uh, teachers unlimited access to the internet, so they're working towards getting that hooked up. Uh, much of the meeting was spent um, with a couple of gentlemen from Coastal Computers. Uh, there were technicians coming in to make some recommendations to us about uh, developing a, a finely tuned plan for the final pieces of our networks that need to be hooked up. We have a lot of pieces in place, uh, but we don't have the expertise, uh, the technical expertise, I think, to finish that off, and we need to have a, a perhaps a, uh, a consultant of some sort come, come in to uh, finalize our plans. Charlie wanted to speak to that as well. Uh, and and uh, I wasn't able to attend the last part of the meeting, Gary. I don't know if there was significant other information covered at the end. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> one of the one of the areas that's that remains to be wired is the high school, and also how we connect the buildings and what options are out there for us, and also when we get into actually networking within buildings and networking buildings to buildings, and I think what we need is we need we need a plan, and the and we don't have the expertise within or the time within house to do that so I think we really do need to go outside and and find a consultant and this is one of the companies that does this in fact they have been working with the middle school and specifically Pond Cove in in getting those patch panels etc um, even laying the wiring needs to be you know laid out in some kind of plan with someone who has some expertise of what you're going to connect those to and what what options are going to be, and what, they're going, what options they're going to be used for. So I really think that we need, as a board, this year to find somewhere in our money um, to start that process. I don't think it's something we can wait until we approve a budget for next year. I think we need to have a plan to know what it's going to cost us for next year. That can range anywhere from four to $10,000, depending on what. Um, this particular firm, uh, would help us draw up what we would need to go out to bid for wiring and patch panels and all those kinds of things. So I think it, it would serve us well, especially with the 9X and the state initiatives that are coming down. So what I would propose for our next finance subcommittee meeting that we have this as a discussion issue. Great. Scott, did you want to speak to that? Yeah. <clears throat> Okay. Um, I have one other question um, since Gary's here, and it had to do with Gail Adshead's letter to us um, thanking John Albion for the donation of, of a laptop and other hardware. Uh, has she been in contact with you about, I think, I think this has got to be referred to the Technology Committee. When we have hardware being donated to the system. I think it needs, we need to make sure that it fits our technology plan, that it's not going to be stuff that's going to require, you know, some high maintenance and that kind of thing. Um, I should have brought this letter yesterday and I, to the meeting and I forgot. Okay. I just, I want to make sure that, you know, I want to recognize and accept what, what we need, but I don't want to add additional maintenance burdens to, to a very limited 
but uh, line item budget. <laughs> yes. Right. But uh, some of these were donated too, and I just want to make sure that you know what we receive is just are in relatively good shape and are, aren't going to require us to put additional monies into making them adaptable. Thank you, Charlie Connie. Uh, I just want to underscore that need for planning. The, um, we talked last month about the state plan for wiring the world. And um, there's an awful lot, of course, it will be locally re responsible locally. We still don't have final uh, outlines of what will happen. I mean, it, of course, as I said before, it is an exciting vision. But I'm glad that, they're, that the technology committee is, is aware, and I'm sure they are from my conversations with people. Um, this is a step-by-step -step process, and I think we should get busy and, and get that planning done. I'd be happy to help make that happen. In the, in the last two meetings we've had, the town librarian has been there. Yes. So that's uh, we've uh, talked to him, yeah. been very important right. as a town concept. Right. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Keith. Um, the next committee is Policy Subcommittee. Ann? Um, the Policy Subcommittee met on January 27th. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and we went over, once again, the weapons in the school's policy that we had sent to um, our attorney for review, and um, also the student locker and storage facility policy. Um, we do have those policies um, tonight for a first reading, along with um, a recruiting and hiring of administrative staff and um, procedure um, that we needed to implement uh, for the superintendent search. Um, also, in the packet is um, the revised affirmative action plan. That is not actually the policy. We're going to, we, did, we didn't, we got that since our last meeting, so we haven't had a chance to boil that down to an actual policy. But if anybody's read it and has any comments they want to make tonight or, um, you know, by our next policy meeting, that would be great. Hopefully we'll have a first reading of the actual policy next month. Um, we also had, um, after the school board workshop on the guidance and health uh, curriculum, we did have a meeting with the, um, on February 8th with the guidance and health um, staff, uh, K-12. Um, Beth and I attended that meeting, and Rick DeFusco was also there. I think it was um, a good meeting. It seemed like the staff was um, very excited about the prospect of looking at developing a real sequence of curriculum, K-12 in those areas, uh, defining uh, you know, ways to evaluate programs um, and updating them as necessary. Some, you know, some things in the health area in particular are changing rather rapidly. Um, and two, two other things uh, we talked about doing was trying to define school responsibilities versus parent responsibilities and also areas of overlap between the two and how, you know, how we can help parents without t actually taking over their jobs. And also, um, another thing we talked about was uh, the need to define expectations for our students, um, K-12, both in terms of how they behave in the classroom and just what our general expectations are um, for them um, when, when they're in the schools. Um, <coughs> at, this, at this point, it seems like an overwhelming task um, that we thought it, it might be best if we had a uh, facilitator come in to, to help people uh, frame these issues, much like the technology committee did at the beginning when it seemed like this could never be managed and now we have a beautiful plan. Um, so right now we're looking into the possibility of getting a facilitator to come in at the next um, teacher workshop day, which is a curriculum day, so that um, staff in this area can sit down and, and, and map, out a, map out a plan in that area. So it's an exciting, exciting new system-wide initiative. Um, our next policy subcommittee meeting is March 7th, 8.30 to 10.30 in the Council Chambers Conference Room. Thank you, Anne. Any questions, Charlie? <clears throat> Just on the affirmative action plan, when you get into writing the policies on um, allegation of harassment, physical and or sexual abuse, will those be specifically the way they're laid out in here, one for staff and 
or employees and one that covers everyone else or well we we do have the staff one yeah. okay so and the only one that we don't have would cover students is the, or any um the one that i can't put my hand on it right now but the one that's uh, specifically and the allegation been, yeah. of harassment okay. physical or sexual abuse we, that, that's one that that's would be one we one. don't have okay um what you would note um and i really want to thank belinda snell our affirmative action officer has been gathering backup material and did some uh also scanning of of our current employees and so forth to get the packet for you when she came to something that we didn't have as a policy she framed it as if i would be signing it uh, as an administrative policy i think um, obviously with our process the board subcommittee will be uh, reviewing that and turning that into a board level policy it, it would be helpful to have belinda come to um, our <coughs> next meeting okay. to just walk us through this it's not an area all of us are all that familiar with in terms of the nuances once we have this policy in in place will this become a part of the high school or middle school handbook certainly the uh, we're already distributing the harassment policy the um there's another one in here i'm talking about the student the student one yes as a matter of fact both the high school and the particularly the middle school i think is doing a fine job of communicating to students not only the policy or the procedures um, that they follow but uh, explaining why and we're really working on it i think the lighthouse project as far as the incoming freshmen but i think it needs to be reiterated again when they get into high school they do i know at the middle school that they have assemblies and mm -hmm. they do talk specifically about the policy what we don't what we don't have is a school board policy on this issue but i think the the schools have been covering it um regardless of that so it'll come down and come back in a pared down version okay. thank you ann uh, next committee is the research strand committee uh gail or carla or I wasn't at the meeting. Um, I guess that's me. I guess it's you, Gail. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let me find my like notes here. Okay, our last meeting was on January 25th, and uh, Jim Curry came and gave us the finalized presentation of the course that's going to be offered in um, our three schools, and we proposed that eight teachers be um, participate from each school building and that's not um, cast in stone it can be you know, different numbers depending on who's interested in doing that but um, I'm trying to look at the start update the teachers are going to be having meetings with their um, librarian media center specialists uh, explaining what the course will um, involve and what the commitment will will be and then they're hoping to have their first class um, on March 9th at 3.30 in the middle school library. And <coughs> Connie, do you have any more to say? You March, 9th, March 9th is Saturday. Is Saturday. It must be, I think it's March 7th, isn't it? Is it? Near March 9th is a Saturday. Yeah, I, th I think the date is the 7th. Uh, anyway, we we have been getting that, I think, the proper date to the teachers. Um, I'm sorry, what did you ask me, Gail? Did you have anything more to add? I, I know the committee is so excited about it. We were afraid that there would be many more people signing up than the eight per building because we all thought it was such a wonderful opportunity. So. Well, um, Mary and I have attended, uh, she and I together attended the Pond Cove meeting um the middle school meeting has been held and it has a the high school meeting was held yesterday and so far they have four or five people and there uh, are several others who are considering it and and the high school also had their meeting last week okay um obviously uh it is always hard to predict how many people will be able given the schedule although this is a much more flexible schedule than we normally are able to have um, actually, the university is kind of leaning over backwards here to give us some flexibility. The course itself will be actually going on until next December, and it will be focused on teachers using work that they're already doing, going out and finding work that other, some of their peers are doing, 
um, and um, it really is an action research model, mm -hmm. um, as well as the components of uh, some teachers will probably do some extra work to make sure this all gets written down and not just in somebody's individual coursework, but as a document that the school system can use. It is a wonderful opportunity, and we, um, our only concern is that we have people in a busy time of year. Um, hopefully, this won't comp the people who are most interested uh, will be able to find the time. So we don't have the final list. Any other questions? Then the art uh, committee report. Um, we had two meetings since the last school board meeting because the January one had been pushed back by snow. Um, we had that meeting on January 22nd, and we had that one in the Pond Cove Art Room as a change from the middle school art room, just so everyone on the committee could see all the new spaces. Um, we completed our work of discussing the curriculum K through 12, and we focused on the music curriculum at this meeting. Um, we decided also that we would like to have some student representation on the committee, which has sort of been our trend lately. And the high school reps were going to look into getting a couple of students on the committee. And we also decided to do some site visits to some other schools just to get a handle on what other schools have in terms of curriculum and how other schools work it into scheduling and budget considerations. And we were all going to get some ideas of where to visit and what kinds of questions. And we would all ask the exact same questions to all the schools we visited so we would have consistency and responses. Um, we're also beginning to discuss and work on the mission and vision. And the second meeting was just yesterday. And um, Keith will report on that meeting. Yeah, like Carla said, we met yesterday. Um, it's turning out that the Arts Committee and Technology Committee are meeting at the same time, <laughs> switching in between them somewhat. Uh, we, we continued discussion um, and looked at a couple of, of documents that, that have uh, come to light in terms of written curriculums that are already out there, also including the, uh, the learning results for the state of Maine. Uh, Several people have chosen sites to visit, and a form has been developed with specific questions to ask when they go on the site visits. Uh, some of the, the questions include community expectations. Do they already have a, a mission statement or curriculums written? Uh, any assessment uh, practices in terms of how are they assessing the, uh, the arts? Uh, within their school, what's the budget and the, the per pupil and district budget for their arts? Uh, how are things scheduled? Uh, so we're, we're definitely moving along. Um, for the next meeting, uh, there's going to be a subcommittee meeting <coughs> between now and the next meeting, which is March 11th, uh, to draft a, uh, a mission statement. Um, so I think we're at the point where we can put down a mission statement. Uh, which will be done by March 11th, and, and or the draft will be done by March 11th, and we're hoping to be able to have uh, that draft uh, at the uh, this teacher day uh, that, that's going to be on Saturday, and in wherever that is in March. March 30th. Yep. Okay. Uh, so we are definitely rolling along, and as I mentioned, the next meeting is going to be Monday, March 11th. Thank you, Keith. Any questions? <laughs> Oh, yeah, sorry. One, one last thing that was covered is, is we're just currently uh, inventorying everything that we have in the arts department in terms of uh, the fixed equipment and so forth. Great. Thank you. Uh, next item is unfinished business, proposed schedule for making up teacher workshop days. Connie? Um, I did include in your packet a, a memo um, with my proposal for making up two teacher workshop days uh, from last month. Obviously, you will remember we talked about that, um, indicating that the most likely way for us to get a handle on the situation so that we're not really seriously going to the 4th of July was to take uh, the, the two remaining workshop days that we had, February 16th and April 5th, change those to actual teacher pupil days which would leave us, depending, of course, on how the weather goes, uh, and I will not say anything about that at this moment, um, just hopefully that 
we've seen the worst, um, that, that would allow us to um, finish our teacher pupil days um, within the, the, what is it, third week, I think right at the 20th, I forget the exact date. The 22nd. 20, does anybody over there know? Tw no? 21st? We're, we're to the 20th, I think, Either right the 20th now. or the 21st, but since we aren't out of winter yet, we won't get too precise about that. Our concern was not to have, go over to a Monday of the following week. Um, so that the making up the teacher days then, um, as this memo indicates, I'm proposing that Saturday, March 30th, be designated as a makeup day for teacher workshop day originally scheduled for February 16th. The staff development committee has already started planning activities geared to system-wide curriculum issues. In addition, placing this workshop on Mar March 30th allows uh, at least some of our math and science teachers to take advantage of a curriculum frameworks presentation going on in Scarborough under the auspices of the Maine Math and Science Alliance. The use of a Saturday may bring up some conflicts in teacher obligations. I've already been told by some staff that they have some conflicts with coursework that they're taking, but I anticipate being able to work these through. What I am asking is that any teacher, and I'll be sending out a memo subsequent to this vote, any teacher uh, for whom this creates an undue hardship, I will ask them to please contact me so that we can work through what that would be. I, my sense is from my discussion with the Teachers Association, and I believe that they actually sent out a memo asking teachers to indicate whether they, how they felt about it, and uh, at least the majority understood that this wasn't a, probably the least painful way to make it up, and so that has been brought to the attention of the Teachers Association. Now the April workshop day is primarily used for parent conferences at least K-8. I am proposing that teachers plan these conferences and any other workshop related activities in the afternoon and evening hours of the week beginning April 1st with a schedule of these activities submitted to building principals. The high school has requested the opportunity to make up this day on a different schedule possibly after the last day of school. But since the high school does not do conferences at that time of year, I'm very comfortable with recommending that we ask them to submit a proposal. Um, according to my last conversation with the high school, that's probably what it will be. Again, as I said, I have consulted with the Teachers Association and feel we have general consensus. I'm asking for a vote from you to affirm this arrangement. Are there any questions? Question. Mm. Have we, uh, um solve the problem with the seniors or is there no longer a problem with the senior day requirements? Well, uh, I haven't had a final discussion on the senior, the number of days between. You, uh, the thought was to wait until after the February vacation to see if you have any more, you know, to get it close to the idea of setting a schedule and have to hit with another snow day, with the idea of waiting until after February vacation. We talked about the Saturday for the exams, be one, one, one of the days, and then the second day we're working on with the seniors. So I haven't come up with anything yet. Can you go back a little bit? How many days do the seniors need to make up right now? Officially, they need to make up four days. Four days officially. Right. And you're, we're, t we're talking about two days right we're now. We're talking two right now, All right. Okay. And there's little chance that the state would give us a waiver on two days. There's little chance. Yeah. Okay. No chance. So the vote is on the workshop days for the the school, but it's not including the not, no, this is seniors. Not, this is, that's a separate issue. Okay. But graduation stays at the seventh. I hope. Yes, okay. I hope so. <laughs> is there a motion? Oh, I, I move we accept this proposal. Is there a second? <laughs> Clear. Should I be? What's your proposal? That we that we have full school days on the two workshop days, February 16th and April 5th, and that the teachers um, work on arranging for a teacher workshop day on the 30th of March, and that they. Uh, I don't know how to. What, what's going to happen with that April 5th day? Follow the proposed schedule. Follow the proposed schedule for <laughs> April 5th. I second that. <laughs> Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Seven zero. Thank you. And I will send out a memo 
um, that I trust everybody will get before the end of the week as far as staff goes so that they will be able to firm up any of the um, issues we need to take care of. The next item is the vote on the PAS budget. Charlie? At our December um, Finance Subcommittee meeting, I presented the um, PAS General Advisory Committee budget for the 96-97 year. Um, this is for new equipment or replacement equipment budget. Um, our share is $1,658.01. This equates out to about $151 per student that we send. We send 12 students. It represents 1.7% of a $97,530 budget. This is all it costs us to send our students to pass other than transportation. So I would propose um, that we accept our share of $1,658.01. Is there a second? Second. Priscilla, discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. The next item is new business, and um, do we have a request for a break so we can read new material that we just received? Somebody. Do we need a motion? I think we need a motion. Yes. Yes. Do. I move that we take a five-minute break. I second, second that. <laughs> All those in favor? We will be back in five minutes after we have read the material. Leave. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Um, at this time of year, as I explain in the um, board packet, <coughs> the, our statutes on administrative employment um, have changed the timeline. We used to do these things, I think, probably more likely in May uh, for the previous year, but we now do it in February. It always gives me a great deal of pleasure to nominate the administrative staff. This is a group that I spend a lot of time with, I work with, we talk a lot on the phone as well as in person. So I have uh, a very real sense of their contribution to the school district. Um, we also, I, I really should say that I think that many times administrators do not get uh, as many, well, sort of bouquets as classroom teachers do. Um, administrators are often caught in the middle. The person who is expected both by teachers, parents, and frankly by the board and probably by me too, to handle the tough situations is the administrator. And um, I sometimes am distressed when I see in newspaper articles, um, uh, no offense, Josh, <laughs> that uh, if there is a budget cut looming, of course we should start with administrators. People, it's like one of those jobs that people really honestly don't know how much uh, they do in fact contribute to classroom uh, teaching going well and smoothly. So it is with a great deal of pleasure that I say thank you, job well done, and nominate our slate of administrators. Rick DeFusco, high school principal. Randy Ray, high school assistant principal. Nancy Houghton, middle school principal. Bill Jewett, middle school assistant principal. Tom Eismeyer, Pond Cove principal. Nancy St. John, Pond Cove assistant principal. Wayne Doerr, director of special education. Keith Weatherby, halftime athletic director. And although uh, community services does not fall under the same contractual obligations as the uh, school administrators, we typically add them at this time too. So Sue Weatherby, Director of Community Services, and Janet Hoskin, Assistant Director of Community Services. And this nomination is for the 1996-97 school year. Are there any questions, Carla? I just move that we accept the superintendent's nominations for administrator contracts for 1996-97 school year. Is there a second? Second. We got the Pick <laughs> <laughs> one. Gail. Okay. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? 7 0. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is nominations for athletic coaching positions for 95 96. And you have in your packet a list. Um, 
with uh, some information, the level, the hours, and what that amount uh, adds up to. Uh, so I will simply read the list. List Varsity Baseball, Scott Shea, um, JV, both assistant and JV baseball have been advertised but not filled yet. Varsity Softball, Janet Hoskin, assistant softball, Marge Queen, JV Softball, Tony Gidoni, Varsity Lacrosse, Charlie Birch, assistant lacrosse, Kirk Juglovich, JV Lacrosse, Ben Raymond, Boys Track, Scott Hendry, assistant Boys Track, Larry Greer, Girls Track, Ray Cooper, the assistant girls track has not been filled yet. Boys tennis, Andy Strout. Um, and assistant girls tennis, Sue Ray. We also have uh, an additional nomination on a separate piece. Uh, Kevin Sears, 7th and 8th grade girls B team basketball. Are there questions? Charlie? Last year with tennis, I believe Andy was both boys and girls coach and that he had two assistants is what is the game plan this year? It would be the same actually had three assistants. And that's what we plan to do again. Okay. So we're we're now looking for two assistants. Correct. Okay. So it really should read boys and girls tennis coach. Okay. Ann? Can I just ask what the status is um, for the assistants and JV coaches who, the, the status of filling those slots? Uh, we've advertised and uh, we're in the process of getting the applications now. And I'm uh, hoping that the, the week after the vacation will be an uh, interview with the team. When do they actually start practicing for these sports? March 25th. That, that's all spring sports? <clears throat> and we adhere to that? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. uh, other questions? Comment? Gail? Okay. I have a comment. Um, that I'm going to support the nominations for the spring sports positions that have just been presented to us. Uh, and that my vote of support represents the trust that I'm placing in the administration that the individuals that they have put forth before us are fair, supportive, and offer uh, positive sports experiences for all team players, and that the high school has just started in September a survey for parents that can be sent back that will assist and assure us that we are providing for our students programs that have the highest standard of sportsmanship and teamwork, and that they are coached and assisted by adults with exemplary behavior and respect for all players. Thank you, Gail. Appreciate it. Any other comments? I would just concur with what yeah. Gail said. So I move. Charlie? I move acceptance of the coaching positions put forth by the superintendent for the spring sports 1999 6. Second. Second, Gail. <clears throat> Any more discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. Thank you. Next item is co-curricular position for the 95-96 year. And in your packet, um, a piece of business we need to catch up with. It's a change of team leader at second grade in December. Uh, Dottie Anderson resigned as team leader for second grade and beginning in January, uh, Joe Thayer agreed to serve. Um, so we would ask you to vote on her as the uh, replacement for the second grade team leader. Anne? I'm just wondering why we're just hearing about this now. Um, frankly, I think it fell through the cracks. Is there a motion? I move acceptance of the of Joe Thayer as the second grade team leader for the remainder of this year. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> Carla, any discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. Thank you. 
Next item is resignations. Um, we have two, and the letters are included in your packet. One is uh, from Pam Rawson, who has been on leave this year, uh, working with the Brunswick SAD 75 Beacon Center. As she says in her letter, she has enjoyed the work very much. Um, she did have a discussion with me about the possibility of coming back at the end of her leave and has decided that she would like to stay and keep her options open to continue the work that she's now doing. So she's submitting her resignation. She was a math teacher with us for several years. Um, and we certainly wish her well. I know she's enjoying what she's doing. I saw her at a workshop not too long ago and she was really um, very enthusiastic. The other letter is from Mary Ellen Fegan, uh, who's been a kindergarten teacher with us. She is uh, frankly getting married and moving out of state, so she will be leaving. Uh, when she came to see me, she was very concerned that people understand that she really cares about her little pupils and that she certainly would do anything she could to help the transition. Uh, so this is a letter of resignation for you to accept, but in my notes I also pointed out to you uh, what we have is a long-term substitute situation here, and uh, Tom and I discussed this and discussed it with our two half-time kindergarten teachers, and we have decided that our best bet is to ask Ingrid Stressinger and uh, Linda Alfiero to pick up um, each matching the, the, the one section they're already teaching, the morning or afternoon section, because they, of course, are experienced in uh, clearly um, on top of what the program is, um, this will be an arrangement that will continue to the end of the year. You don't have to vote on that because it's a long-term sub. We take care of that administratively. I'm informing you because obviously you will have probably questions from parents and you need to know what we are doing. Thank you. Have those parents been um, told who the subs will be? I'm not sure at this point. Um, I would just wait until Any questions? Entertain a motion, Carla? I was going to make a comment first. Oh, comment. Um, I think it's always unfortunate when something like a resignation occurs in the middle of a school year, and I think that we're extremely fortunate that we have teachers already in the system in place that are able to take over. Mm -hmm. I think it worked out very nicely. I agree. Is there a motion? I move. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that we accept the resignations okay. of Pam Rawson and Mary Ellen Stegner. Is there a second, Gail? All those in, oh, any more discussion? All those in favor? 7 0. <coughs> Thank you. And good luck to both of you. Um, the next item is discussion of the proposed organizational changes in the central office regarding community services. Connie? Okay, this is an issue we have actually um, been working on for mm, four or five years in one way or the other. Um, and I realize in trying to bring it forward that we probably need truly a workshop because some of the questions that you've had um, exceed the time we have today to really get into it. I'd just like to say in background that um, when I walked in the door five and a half years ago, we were a lot of crises in maintenance and custodial issues, planning about the buildings and so forth, but a lot of crises just in day-to-day -day management. Um, and I quickly discovered that community services had actually started a role that is scheduling the use of buildings. And one way or the other, I have asked uh, community services to do a lot of different things. It's time we sort that out what should belong to community services programming, what should belong to um, actual uh, facility management, more in the nature of supervision of some of the uh, custodial maintenance operations. Um, so I've actually started that process by giving you a memo on it. Um, we have had some discussions internally with the town manager. Uh, he's also kind of raised the issue, had a workshop where this was an item of, among others with the town council. Um, I've sat down and discussed this with uh, Sue Weatherby, our community services director, so you see 
at least one way to look at this is to rewrite that job description. Uh, we also sat down with Scott, our business manager. Um, that particular, his job description is one we rewrote uh, three years ago when we hired him. Uh, we looked at it and made a few adjustments to that. The same thing is true for the maintenance director position. Uh, these are really sort of meshed, intermeshed positions. They are a team and they work together. So um, I think my recommendation to you tonight is rather than get bogged down in a lot of detail, uh, some of which we don't have on paper, why don't we plan to do a workshop review of this sometime as soon as we can schedule it, given other things that you're dealing with, we might be able, for instance, to tack this on to another <coughs> workshop or part of the budget discussion. I don't think we have any problem here, but I do think we need some sorting out because in small systems like this, we have a lot of overlapping pieces. And our my effort now, or our effort as a team, is to try to sort that out and make sure that um, you know, that as we go down the road, or you go down the road, I won't necessarily be there, that these um, um, these things are, are well described and the job description is clear. That sounds good. Is there a motion? Ann? I move that we table the discussion of the organizational changes regarding community services to a workshop to be scheduled in March. I'd like to add, um, that it would be great to have the town manager and town counselors um, invited to come to that workshop. That would be great. We will try to set a date as soon as possible and get that out to everyone. I second that. Is there any discussion? Charlie? Since the town council did have a workshop, or was, this was one of the items on their workshop on January 29th, there was a letter to the town council chair and a copy to council members, town manager, and school superintendent from John McGinty, and I would like copies of that sent to the board. I haven't seen it yet. Okay. I don't know where it is. It was a letter dated February 9th, 1996. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you I should have received a copy. Yeah. Well, so far okay. I haven't. I will give you this copy. Thank you. Time. Thank you, Charlie. Carla? The uh, motion specifically said meeting in March. Do we think that we will actually be able to schedule it in March given everything else, or should we just say to be determined? I think we have to do it in March. Okay. It's going to be a busy March. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any more discussion? All those in favor? 7 0. Uh, the next item on the agenda is policies, first readings. Anne. Everybody ready? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> we only have a whole bunch of things to go through. Um, we'll just start at the top of the list with the weapons in the school. Um, this, this is a policy that has been under review um, actually since last year, and it has been uh, gone over um, by, by our attorney. And, um, you know, we also had Jack Nichols involved in these discussions as well as the uh, middle school and high school administrators. And um, I think this is our, this is a good legal effort here. <laughs> I'm not going to try to, uh, you know, explain all the law that goes with this, but, you know, this is what, what we're being advised to do. It is required by law. It is we required have. by law. I just have to say, I feel a certain amount of sorrow that we are having to deal with this issue. Having said as much, I will move on. Any comments, questions, concerns? If not, it's going to come back next month, or second reading. Okay. Uh, the next one is student assessment. Um, this is just adding the language in bold at the bottom of the policy asking that the school department guidance staff uh, report the results of all our standardized testing programs um, twice yearly, the June and November meetings. And, and this is a, as a result of the uh, policy subcommittee meeting we had in January where, you know, we talked over the, the assessment programs. We thought it would be best to just formalize it so we know when to expect to get these reports. Sounds fun. And is that what's going to happen then with the current um, test results we have? Are we going to wait to June? 
Um, frankly, Madam Chair, I thought it, <laughs> that those well, were going to be on this. Um, well, I did too. I know Connie was supposed to check on that if we were going to uh, have a report. We're going to do it in March. We did to have a discussion with the high school. Okay. All right, and then I think we should just get in sync. That way, it'll be at regularly scheduled times, and maybe we can um, devise some kind of reporting format that'll make it easier on people to track these things over time. Student locker storage facilities. Um, I don't know if Connie wants to set the background on this. I know there was a, uh, a push by the uh, Cumberland County District Attorney to asking um, school boards to adopt policies in this area. It certainly is an area that we should spell out so that there is no question um, for anybody involved, administrator, school board, um, parents, staff, community, um, students. Um, where where we're going in this issue, on this issue? So, Connie, did you want to say anything about that? Or well, yes, I think this is an issue that used to be um, again like the weapons in the school issue, um, simply not much discussion. But in fact, what this uh, policy spells out that the lockers do not belong to students; they belong to the school, and they are described here as a storage facility such as lockers, team rooms, and desks. Um, this policy is intended to govern only those storage facilities made available to and used by Cape Elizabeth students or students of other schools. It goes on to say they are school property. Um, and all st storage facilities are subject to periodic random administrative search. Public school officials are not required to obtain a search warrant prior to conducting a search of a student locker or other storage facility. Uh, when I was a junior high principal, I 20, well, almost 20 years ago, 15 years ago, um, it became obvious to me that the schools had been uh, used as a, in a variety of ways as um, in ways that somehow most of us hadn't really thought of. That I uh, would occasionally have reason to suspect that there were drugs and uh, would be in a position to open lockers. It's been a clear and persistent legal right for the administrator in a school building um, to open a locker and to, uh, there are certain procedures one has to be careful about, but at the same time, if you have suspicion that there may be um, some kind of contraband in that locker, uh, I had students telling me 15 years ago, you can't touch that, it's mine. It is not the students, the locker is not the students. Now where this gets tricky, a random search, which is what the, um, what the uh, DA's office, uh, the letter to all the school districts in the area, is trying to make it clear that we have language in our high school and middle school handbooks that make it clear that the lockers are not private property, that uh, from time to time they may well be opened. We are not necessarily opening them in a random way, suspiciously looking for drugs. That is, for instance, I used to see Again, in my days as a junior high principal, the librarian who was just tired of having tons of overdue books come up and open every locker in a row and haul out the library books. I don't know that anybody's doing that anymore, but that was simply the understanding at the end of the year, if people leave things in their lockers, we open the lockers and dump the stuff out, and if it's usable, it uh, goes to Goodwill or whatever. Surprising what you sometimes find in those lockers, and I won't list it, but the not contraband, just you wonder how <laughs> somebody got out of school with their slip or whatever in the locker. Sometimes you find a lot of old food. Uh, that usually identifies itself, however, so that you know that it's there at some point. Um, but seriously, the, uh, the usual dividing line on these things between a random search is what you can see. That is, if you open a locker and you're just making the point you don't own the locker, which is what the random search is all about, uh, and there are, uh, there is a pocketbook or a locker bag or something of that sort in there that we don't have the right to open those unless there is reasonable or, in fact, we don't need as high a suspicion is reasonable, but we do have to have some kind of, of, of suspicion, and we, the phrase usually is reasonable, um, that, that we have a right to look in, into those uh, bags. So kids need to be aware, we need to have policies, and we need to communicate with parents and students that um, 
If we think there is something going on, the information we're given uh, is clear that there may be some um, passing of materials or what have you, yes, the administrator of the building does have a right not only to open the locker but also to ask the student to empty the bag, bag open it, and that's our usual procedure. We would get the student and ask them to open it. Um, it's. I find it very sad that we're having this discussion, that we have to alert students to the fact that they cannot use the school as a way to hide things. And I found it very sad 20 years ago to think that, that schools could be called drug stores in some ways. The fact that people had decided that there was um, a market here and that they would use kids to sell drugs to kids. And that there is no way that we can have, nor should we have, the kind of punitive measures it would take to flush out every single small packet of anything. Um, but this is one step to say that please do not think that, that, um, uh, that this, is, this is the right way to use it. I do want to make it clear that we work with uh, legal counsel. We have had workshops. We do know what we're empowered to do and what we're not empowered to do. We are not in any way wanting to uh, infringe on anybody's rights, um, but this issue is one that has been called to our attention by our local uh, district attorney. It's one that we have been dealing with anyway, and we think that this is a reasonable statement of the problem. Thank you, Connie. Uh, there are questions by the board for Ann or any of us? Okay. <coughs> Next month. Um, I just want to follow up. I had asked um, Rick if he could um, share this with the um, student government and the high school, this policy, just, you know, just to let them know that, you know, we are discussing this. I have not had a chance to, to attend an SAC meeting, but today um, on the intercom I explained to the, the entire student body of the policy uh, that was going to be recommended tonight and explain that. It took a few minutes of, uh, of our announcement time to do that. But I will, again, process that with them. But everyone knows about it. And then in the navigator for next fall, both the policy and the weapons policy and the new policy on locker or facility use uh, will, will be in that, uh, in that uh, brochure. Okay, that's good. I think it's also important at the, at the middle school, I think. I think it's, it's a very touchy issue with high school right now because this, these issues have been in the news um, so, somewhat, so I thought it would be a courtesy for them to, to know we were discussing it. Um, but obviously it should be in the middle school um, handbook as well next year once these are adopted. Okay, um, the last one is the recruiting and hiring of administrative staff. Um, to me, this, this uh, policy seems somewhat redundant to some other policies we have in our book, but um, at our January 29th workshop on the superintendent search, um, Main St School Management Association did advise us in their long memo of the things we need to do, that this is a policy we need to have in place. And um, we did not actually discuss this at a policy subcommittee meeting because we didn't have the chance, so I basically just lifted the uh, language and tried to, to tidy it up a tiny bit, not <laughs> changing the sense of it. Um, so if anybody has any questions or comments, let me know. Thank you, Ann. It looks good. It's <laughs> That's it. Um, the next item on the agenda is a consideration of the superintendent's request to enter executive session for the purpose of discussing negotiations. Um, but before we do that, I was going to announce the meetings coming up. There are a lot of them. <laughs> um, Thursday, February 29th, will be the workshop on the superintendent qualifications. The um, place to be announced, but it will be at 7 p.m. Beth, I believe we're, we've decided it will be the Pond Cove uh, Media Center. Okay. Pond Cove Media Center for Thursday, February 29th. We have um, the Pond Cove budget and, uh, I mean, sorry, it's the whole budget workshop. It will be at the Pond Cove Media Center on Saturday, March 9th, starting at 8 and going to 4.30. 
We have Thursday, March 14th, a 7 o'clock executive session for the board to select finalists, semi-finalists for the superintendent. Before that meeting, we have Tuesday, March 12th, finance subcommittee at 6.30, regular school board meeting at 7.30, and a school board policy subcommittee meeting on Thursday, March 7th, 8.30 to 10.30, in the town hall second floor conference room. New location. Change. Um, we need a calendar to keep these all straight, and there are lots more in March. Um, but we encourage people to attend all of those meetings. <coughs> Is there a motion to enter executive session? I move Priscilla? that. Oh, no. no. Anne, go. <laughs> to move that we enter executive session for the purpose of discussing negotiations. Is there a second? Priscilla? I second that. All those in favor? 7 0. No, those just I mean, that was